All right, I'm back with a study here on wine in the Bible. Um, what does the Bible say? What is wine? Um, I'm doing this study as a request from Brother Brian and a few others. They've asked me to do this a while back, and I just never got around doing it. I just, I really didn't know if I should do it or not because there's a lot of people out there that think that wine in the Bible is grape juice, and it's not. It's not. Okay, that's a lie. Um, you're going to see from the study here that grape juice was actually not invented until the 1800s. And to say that wine in the Bible is uh, grape juice, you got a hard time proving that. Okay, wine is not grape juice. Wine is fermented juice of grapes. And just like right here, 18, Webster's 1820 Dictionary. And let me say this too, that grapes from wine are completely different than the grapes you buy in a store. Okay? And the grapes are used to make grape juice. Those are two completely different fruit. Um, they're not the same thing. Um, right here, um, the Webster's 1820 Dictionary. And before I get started, let me just say this. Um, I ask you to hear me out on this and uh, have an open mind and understand that this is what the Bible says and this is the truth. And there's a lot of lies out there about what wine is in the Bible and what the Bible says about it. People want to say to shun alcohol and shun wine. Fine. If you just want, don't want anything to do with it, I'm not pushing it on you. I want to make that very clear. I'm not pushing this on you saying you have to drink it or whatever. No. I'm just saying there's a lot of misconceptions out there about what, you know, what wine is in the Bible, okay, and what the Bible says. It's not grape juice, okay. Um, and to say that, in my opinion, is blasphemy to Jesus Christ because you're going to see in this study here that it's a big process to make wine. It's not something simple. It's a long process. Sometimes it takes years to do. It's a lot of work involved. And I'm going to show you some pictures of me working in the winery. I'm going to give my testimonial of me working here at a winery. Not here now, not here where I'm at now, but this was in Texas. And I have some experience in this field. I understand winemaking. I understand there's a lot of chemistry involved. It's a big process, okay? And when somebody ignorantly says, oh, wine in the Bible is just grape juice, it just makes me laugh. Because because back when I was uh, getting into the winemaking, you know, uh, thing, my boss at the time was telling us the story of Jesus Christ and how he turned water into wine. And I said, I raised my hand and I said, wine in the Bible is just grape juice. They God never, you know, implemented, you know, uh, never, never condoned the drinking of, you know, wine, alcoholic wine. And he just laughed at me. And I, I didn't understand why he was laughing at me. Now I get it. Okay. You go out, you go talk to any uh, vineyard, wine connoisseur. And you ask them, did Jesus turn water into wine? And you tell them it's just grape juice. They're going to laugh your face off. Okay? I'm telling you, you're going to get embarrassed. Because you're very ignorant. You don't understand the process of how wine's making. And let me give you a verse of scripture here. on If you just don't want to turn this off and say, I don't want to hear it, all alcohol sin. Okay, hold on. Proverbs 18, 13. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it's folly and shame unto him. Unto him. It's folly and shame unto you. Okay, so, so yeah, uh, let's get into it. So wine, right here, the fermented juices, the juice of grapes, as the wine of the Madeira grape and the wine of Burgundy or Porto, the juice of certain fruits prepared with sugar, spirits, okay, and current wine, gooseberries, intoxication. Noah awoke from his wine in Genesis nine twenty one. Drinking, they that tarry long at the wine, Proverbs twenty three twenty twenty three thirty. I'm sorry, you know. Corn and wine in scripture are put in all for all kinds of necessities and substance. Bread and wine is the Lord, in the Lord's Supper are symbols of the body and blood of Christ. All right, we're going to be getting into that stuff. But first, I'm going to talk to you about where I worked, and I'm going to talk to you about the process of winemaking. Okay, I'm going to kind of go through this kind of fast because uh, I got a lot of scripture to go through as well. So I'm going to try to get this all done in one video. So let's get to it. So. Right here we have the website of the place I worked at, the vineyard. This is Keepersaw. This is in Tyler, Texas. Okay, it's actually about seven miles south of Tyler, Texas in Bullard, Texas. Um, I worked here for almost about a year. Um, it's a very beautiful location. A lot of, a lot of beauty here. 
you know, Texas is a very flat state, you know, and, um, and you can just tell by looking at this right here, these are, these are grapes and here's a, the barrel room where they stockpile it, you know, it sits there in ages. Here's some of the, uh, equipment, the, uh, steel containers that we use the fermentation process. You see them mixing it right here, uh, mixing the, making the chemistry, some of the vineyards. Um, it's an art. Let me just say that. Here's a white grape. I guess you can say it. Uh, and let me say this. These grapes are not the same grapes as you would find in a grocery store. Okay. These grapes are, they're not the same fruit. And I'm going to demonstrate that. So let me go to this one here and I'm going to show you that I actually worked here. Here's a picture of me on their website. So I was kind of chunky then. So don't laugh. This was 2012, 2013. So this is the actual bar, the place I bartend and stuff at night to make a little extra money. You see me serving liquor and stuff there. Woo, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, let's move on. Um, here's the, uh, here's one of the bands playing. And you have right here, this is on my Instagram, one of my old Instagram pages. I haven't used this thing in years though. But, um, right here, bands playing. This is behind the bar. You can see all the liquor and stuff there. Um, sun, sunset in Texas. You know, very beautiful sunsets because it's flat out there. So, but, uh, you see us working here. This is me actually, uh, mixing the wine. This is coming through. See what this tube right here does. It's actually flowing through. The grapes are actually flowing through. All right. And they're being pumped by a machine and they're pumped into these containers for the fermentation process. And when we got done, when we got done with the harvest, and stuff we had to do a lot of cleaning i mean there's a lot of work involved with winemaking i when i got into it i couldn't believe it it was hard work too it was not easy a lot of working with your hands um play this little quick video here this is matt one of my closest friends at the time and he uh off the, off the this is one of the things we use to uh press the right hand right here so turn it you know, All right, let me pause that. This is one of the machines. Sorry if you couldn't hear me or not. This is one of the machines that you would put the grapes in. It would crush them, and they would flow through the, the juice would flow through this tube right here at the bottom where the water's coming out. Um, and sometimes, and some of us did do the uh, stomping and stuff. I'm not gonna play that. Um, there's inside one of the steel containers. We had to clean them after they were done being used. Um, here's me right here, my beard. Let's see here. Where's the one about the, uh, the, here we go. Here's where, this is what you call wine in the cluster. New wine found in the cluster, what the Bible calls it in Isaiah 65. Right here. And this is right here, this bubbling effect right here on top is actually carbon dioxide. It's CO2, frozen CO2. So, there's that. And that's, I think that's pretty much it. And a picture of some of the barrels there. But, um, so yeah, um, let me go over here to this Alto Vineyards. So it's a little bit about me, um, my stay there. And, um, so yeah, uh, this is before I was saved, by the way. So, But um, the five stages of wine making the wine making process. Okay, so let's get into it. You have the first step. You have the harvest, which, in my opinion, was the hardest thing to do when it came to the wine making process. Uh, the hard uh, it was it was the hardest one. We had to go out there and pick them off the vineyards in the hot Texas sun. In Texas, it gets really hot. It's one of the hottest places in America in the midsummer. Um, around August, about the time, about the time of the harvest. Okay. And I'm going to read this right here. It says the har harvesting or picking is certainly the first step in the actual wine making process. Without fruit, there will be no wine and no fruit other than grapes can produce annually a reliable amount of sugar to yield sufficient alcohol to preserve the re resulting beverage. Nor have other fruits the requisite acid acids, esters, and tannins to make natural, stable wine on a consistent basis. For this reason, and a host more, 
More, most winemakers acknowledge that wine is made in the vineyard, at least figuratively. In order to make the make fine wine, grapes must be harvested at the precise time, preferably when psychologically, um, whatever that word is, I'm not smart. But anyway, basically when they're right, preferably when they're right. I don't know what that big word is there. But a combination of science and old-fashioned tasting usually go into determining when to harvest with consultants, winemakers, vineyards, managers, and proprietors all having all having their say. Harvesting can be done mechanically or by hand. However, many estates prefer to hand harvest, as mechanical harvesters can uh, often be too rough on the grapes on the vineyards. Once the grapes arrive at the winery, reputable winemakers will sort the grape bunches, cooling out grapes or under ripe fruit before crushing. All right, now crushing and pressing. Um, you'll say, well, see, it says grapes. It says grapes. Okay, hold on. I'm going to show you that there's many, many different types of grapes that are used to make wine. Okay, before you get excited and say, see, it's just grape juice. No, it's not. Okay, just listen. All right. Crushing the whole clusters of fresh ripe grapes is traditionally the next step in the wine making process. Today, mechanical crushers perform the time-honored tradition of stomping or trotting the grapes into what is commonly referred to as must. For thousands of years, it was men and women who performed the harvest dance in barrels and press, presses that began grape juice magical transformation from concentrated sunlight and water held together in clusters of fruit to the most beautiful mystical of beverages, wine. Okay, so if the Bible was to say wine, why... We're going to talk about this in a minute. If the Bible says wine, you know, and it's not, you know, alcoholic, then why does it say wine? Because wine is fermented juice. Okay? It's not grape juice. All right? As with anything in life, changes changes evolve something lost and something gained. But using mechanical presses, much of the romance and ritual has departed this stage of winemaking. But one need no lament to... Long due to the immense sanitary gain that mechanical pressing brings to winemaking. Mechanical pressing has also improved the quality and longevity of wine by reducing the winemaker's need for preservatives. Having said all this, it is important to note that not all wine begins life in a crusher. Sometimes winemakers choose to allow fermentation to begin inside uncrushed whole grape clusters. I line the natural weight of the grapes and the onset of fermentation to burst the skins of the grapes before pressing the uncrushed cluster hmm so you mean the grapes some of the grapes can't even burst until the fer to the fermentation starts yeah okay because guess what wine comes from a different type of grape than grape juice does okay up until crusting and pressing the steps from making white wine and red wine are essentially the same however in, if a winemaker is to make white wine he or she will quickly press the must after crushing in order to separate the juice from the skin, seeds, and solids. By doing so, unwanted color, which comes from the skin of the grapes, not the juice, and tannins cannot leach into the white wine. Essentially, white wine is allowed very little skin contact, while red wine is left in contact with its skins to garner color, flavor, and additional tannins during fermentation, which of course is the next step. We're going to talk about this. This is pretty interesting right here. Now, the fermentation is the natural process of the where you get your, you know, your alcohol. Now listen to this. This is very interesting. It says fermentation is indeed the magic at play in making the making of wine. If left to its own devices, must or juice will begin fermenting naturally within six to twelve hours with the aid of wild yeast in the air. Hmm. So, so fermentation is a natural process. See. Why do you think they were able to do it in the Old Testament? Plenty of times. Why do you think Noah, after he got off the ark, was able to plant a vineyard and he got, you know, drunk off of it? Why is that? Because God put it in the air for us to have wine. And we're going to see that from the scriptures later. Okay? And it says... In very clean, well-established wineries and vineyards, this natural fermentation is a welcome phenomenon. However, for a variety of reasons, many winemakers prefer to intervene at this stage by inoculating the natural must. This means they will kill the wild 
and sometimes unpredictable natural yeast and then introduce a strain of yeast of personal choosing in order to, to more readily pre predict the end result. Regardless of the chosen path, once fermentation begins, it normally continues until all the sugar is converted to alcohol. And I'm not talking refined sugar either. I'm talking about pure sugar cane, real sugar. Okay. And a dry wine is produced. Fermentation can require anywhere from 10 days to a month or more. The resulting level of alcohol in wine will vary from one locale to the next. Due to the sh total sugar content of the must, an alcohol level of 10% in cool climates versus a high of 15% warmer areas is considered normal. Sweet wine is produced when the fermentation process stops before all the sugar has been converted into alcohol. This is usually a conscious, inter intentional decision at the part of the winemaker. Yep, absolutely true. Um, you see then, fermentation is a natural process. It's not something added into winemaking. It's not something that you do. It naturally happens. Because these wine grapes are set up that way. Wonder why? Because we have an intelligent designer. You see? He knows what he's doing. You know, these people out here that try to just overthrow what the throw, overthrow overthrow wine in the Bible and try to say it's this great cheese, you're un, you're undermining what Jesus Christ did at the marriage, which you're going to see here in a minute what I'm talking about. Once fermentation is completed, the clarification process begins. Winemakers have the option of racking or siphoning their wines from one tank or barrel to the next, to the hope of leaving the precipitates and solids called pomets. Pomace, I'm sorry, in the bottom of the ferment, fermenting tank. Filtering and fining may also be done at this stage. Filtration can be done with everything from a coarse filter that catches only large solids to a fertile, st sterile fer filter pad that strips strips wine of all life. Fining occurs when substances are added to a wine to clarify them. Often winemakers will add eggs, wh egg whites, clay, or other compounds to wine that will help precipitate dead yeast cells and other solids out of a, of a wine. These substances adhere to the unwanted solids and force them to the bottom of the tank. The clarified wine is then racked into another vessel where it is ready for bottling or further aging. The final stage of the winemaking process involves the aging and bottling of wine. After clarification, the winemaker has a choice of bottling a wine immediately, which is the case of, you know, I can't pronounce that, I never could, <laughs> or he or she can give a wine additional aging, as in the case of Grand Cru Brudo, in Great Napa Valley, Cabernet Sauvignon, okay? Further, a, further aging can be done in bottle, stainless steel or ceramic tanks, large wooden ovals, or small barrels, commonly called barracks. Barracks, I'm sorry. The choice and techniques employed in this final stage of the process are near endless and as the end result however the common result in all cases is wine and you know and and so the wine making process itself you can see on this one right here I got another one pulled up another article pulled up similar to that and you know and then the wine making itself is usually I'm trying to figure out where it's at Mm, I don't think I still have it. I think I deleted it. Yeah, I did. But yeah, winemaking itself can usually last up to one year or three years, depending on what you're making. Okay. So you have the harvest, which starts around, you know, the summertime, and then you're not going to be ready to bottle for almost a whole year later. That's how long the winemaking process is. Okay. It's a very, very long process. There's a lot of chemistry involved. You gotta get every detail right. You gotta know what you're doing. It's not simple. Okay? And so, for Jesus Christ to turn water into wine at the marriage, that's a miracle. Very big miracle. Not something to be undermined. Say, hey, it's his grape juice. It's his grape juice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna see where your little grape juice thing comes from here in a little bit. Okay? Um, the grape varieties. Okay? How about this? Welcome to the Wine Searcher Online Encyclopedia of Wine Grape Varieties. Okay, there is so many. Um, it says right here, there is more than a thousand are covered in detail. A thousand wine grapes. Really? 
you know, and here's some of the more common ones, you know, you have Cabernet Sauvignon, Bordeaux Blend, P Pinot Noir, uh, Savonese, Riesling, Pinot Grigio, Chardonnay, Nibio, and Savonnet Blanc, okay? These are just some of the common ones, and one of my favorites has always been uh, Moscato, which comes from the musket uh, grape, okay? So you got over a thousand different grape varieties, okay? These are not the same as table grapes you buy the store. That's not where, you know, the grape, you know, Welch's grape juice, whatever, comes from table grapes. It's not the same thing, okay? It's not the same thing. And just the other, the difference between wine grapes and table grapes, there's a big difference. If you're wondering why you can't head to the grocery store and pick up some Concord red or green grapes, bring them home, crush them, and turn them into delicious wine, because it's not the same thing. That's why. Congratulations, you've wondered what most people wondered, but have been too afraid to ask. What's the actual difference between table grapes and wine grapes? The answer, a lot actually. Yeah, because they're not the same thing. That's why. The first difference between these grapes is the species from which wine and table grapes originate from. All grapes are used to make that incredible glass of wine you're currently swirling come from the Vitis vinifera species, a species native to the Mediterranean, including Europe and the Middle East. How about that? Where Israel is. Hmm. A land of milk and honey overflowing with wine. We're going to see that later in, in the Bible study. Um, but so, well, while some table grapes also come from this species, others come from species such as Vitis labrusca. Vitis, I don't know how to say that one. I'm going to try. Species that does not make wine but are delicious to eat. Yeah, your table grapes. The completely different. Completely different. Absolutely. A second difference between these two grapes has to do with their th skin thickness. Table grapes have thin skin, perfect for chomping into as you munch away, but that's not ideal for making wine. When it comes to making great wine, especially red wine, a thicker skin is better, and that's exactly what wine grapes have, perfect for imparting tannins and deriving that deep red color you enjoy staring at. Sweetness is another characteristic where these two grape categories differ drastically. While you might think the opposite, wine grapes are much sweeter than table grapes. Uh, and that's a ne necessary thing because grapes need a lot of sugar if yeast is going to convert their juices into alcohol. Fermentation, okay? It's a natural process. It's not something added. Higher sweetness comes from the species itself, along with the fact that wine grapes are harvested much later in the season than grapes meant for the table, allowing their sugars to concentrate, concentra concentrate as much as possible. Wine grapes are harvested at around 22-30% sugar, while table grapes might be closer to 10-15% to sugar. This also means wine grapes deteriorate much faster when picked than grapes meant for the table. Exactly, because they're not the same thing. Okay, does that make sense now? So, wine grapes and table grapes are not the same thing. So, wine grapes are made for wine. Alright, you can't really eat them. Okay, I've tried eating them before, it's kind of gross. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a you just get a mouthful of seeds and stuff. Um, that's pretty much it, and a bunch of juice, you know. Um, so, but yeah, the blood. You know, the Bible talks about the blood of grapes. The blood of grapes is wine, you know. That's why Jesus Christ refers to his blood as wine, you know, in the New Testament, um, in Luke chapter twenty-two. This is the blood of the New Testament, you know. So yeah. But, uh, I think I'm done with this for now. Um, let's move on to the next one. And, uh, I'm going to show you something here. Where does, where does this grape juice thing come from? Okay. And, uh, oh, by the way, if you look this up real quick, let me do this real quick. If you do this, if you go to Google and you type in, for example, Give me a minute. When, oops, was, when was grape juice invented? Okay. 1869. So you got a problem there because when was our Bible put together, you know, in English? 1611. And this was made in 1869. And they used the term wine in the Bible. 
Huh. About that. So yeah, we're going to show you where this Welch's thing comes from. Check this out. Oh, wrong one. I'm sorry. All right. Here we go. And they got some kind of wafer there. You know, that's wrong. But uh, Met Methodist History, Controversy, Communion, and Welch's Grape Juice. Okay. You're probably familiar with Welch's Grape Juice, but you may not know it has ties to the history of the Methodist Church. In the 1800s, church, churches faced a dilemma to combat the epidemic of alcoholism, the temperance movement, advocated total abstinence from al alcohol in celebration of the Lord's Supper, though. The church filled the communion chalice with wine. You know the reason why they had a problem with alcohol? Because they were all lost. A lot of the Methodists, if you know what they believe, um, you know, they, they don't even believe in the atonement of Christ. They reject it. And they say that imputed righteousness of Christ is a heresy and it's wicked. Well, here's your fruit right here. A lot of them turn out to be drunkards, pretty much. Substituting grape juice seems to and it seems an oblivious solution. For us today, it is such common practice. We don't know any different, explains Adrian Pacini, church historian at First United Methodist Church of Vineland, New Jersey. In the 1800s, however, there was no easy task. Raw grape juice stored at room temperature, home refrigerators, was not available until 1913. Naturally, naturally ferments into wine. Uh, no, it doesn't, because the grapes that you use in grape juice are not the same thing. Okay, so they're, they're, see, they're being ignorant right here. They don't know what they're talking about. This caused a problem for congregations not wanting to use anything containing alcohol. Now, we just read over there in these articles that grape, wine grapes, and the grapes you use to make grape juice are not the same thing, didn't we? We can all agree to that, right? What are they doing here? They're being ignorant. They don't know how wine's made. This is exactly what I'm seeing with a lot of you know, so-called Christians out there that say, oh, well, in the Bible, it's grape juice. Okay, you're ignorant. You don't know what you're talking about. Plain and simple. Um, no suitable alternative. One solution was to squeeze grapes during the week and serve the juice before it fermented. But grapes were not really av readily available to every church. Well, first of all, if you're just using regular table grapes, you got a problem. They're not going to ferment. They're not made to ferment. That's not what they're there for. Okay? You don't have wine grapes. Did you pick them, pick them off the vineyard, you know? Of course not. See? They don't even, they didn't even know any better. See? Shows you that, shows you the ignorance right here. Lots of churches didn't have the communion when grapes were out of season, reports Roger Skoll. As a church historian at First United Methodist Church of Vineland, some created commun communion st stewards chose to make their own unfermented sacramental wine. One recipe called adding, for adding a pound of hands squash Raisin pulp. Okay, raisin pulp is not made, is not used to make wine. Okay, it's not the same thing. You already see the problem here. Dried grapes is to quart a, a boiling water. Later in the process, the wine maker, you know, wine maker quote here, was to add an egg white. Doesn't that sound delicious? Not really. It sounds like, it sounds gross to me. Some churches substitute water for wine. Many in the temperance movement declare that, declare water the only proper drink. Jesus' miracle of turning water into wine at the wedding seemed to give the practical to get to give the practice a biblical justification. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Most churches, however, simply continue to use wine, and you should be using wine if you're taking communion. You should not be using anything else. Sorry. I don't agree with you. Not only did it solve the storage problem, it resolved another issue. Many believe that biblical mandate called us called for the use of wine and view the sacrament as an exception to temperance. A sacrament? Why are you calling it a sacrament? Sounds Catholic to me. Others claim the wine used at the last ever must have been unfermented. And there's no such thing as unfermented wine, by the way. It's not a real thing. Not a widely held understanding today, and insisted on receiving the same. The sometimes heated debate continued for decades. In 1864, the General Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church entered the conversation when they approved a report for the temperance community that re recommend the pure juice of the grape be used in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Okay, the pure juice of the grape from, you know, uh, table grapes is not wine grapes. It's not the same thing. <laughs> I don't know how many times I got to say that, you know. And, of course, it goes on about Thomas Welch, and he goes on to make Welch's grape juice and all that stuff. I mean, uh, it just shows you their ignorance. Um and it shows you that a lot of these guys are lost because they don't understand 
you know, they were letting their flesh get the best of them. The works of the flesh are these. You know, drunkenness is one of them. Uh, drunkenness is a sin, by the way. Drinking wine is not. Having a glass occasionally is not a sin. All right. So, um, I think I'm going to stop here. I don't know if I can get through the study in time. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go through the next study and do a part two of this because um, and just show you from the scriptures what the Bible said. I don't know if I can squeeze this in in 30 minutes. Um, I only have like an hour of recording time. So, kind of scared to do that. Um, but, uh, you know what? Let's, let's just try it. Uh, let's just go for it. Alright, let's see here. We all know the first person in the Bible, you know, the first person in the Bible was... Who? Who was the first person in the Bible to plant a vineyard? Um, well, it was Noah. Okay, Noah was the first one to plant a, was the was the first one to plant a vineyard, from my knowledge. And let's see here. Let me get my notes pulled up. I'll be able to move on here. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I thought so. The first one planted a vineyard was Noah. So. Again, and Noah got drunk, and you know, you know what happened. So we'll start with that one. We'll start when. All right. All right. It says, and Noah became, and Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and he and was drunken, and he was uncovered with his tent. And it goes on, you know, about the, uh, you know, curse of, you know, curse of Ham, curse of Canaan you know, whatever, but, um, but yeah, he was drunk by wine, hmm, and what was the, you know, and also the other thing I love, do is the law of first mention, too, in the Bible, the first time wine is mentioned is in Genesis 9:21. law of first mention, and wine did what, got him drunk, which means it was fermented, all right, so now we're gonna to go to other scriptures now. I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you what the Bible says about wine and strong drink, you know, uh, and what God commands of it, you know, and also God's judgment as well, um, and some warnings. Uh, God actually judged people th through wine, believe it or not, uh, which I was kind of shocked, you know, doing some of this, you know, going through so many scriptures and stuff, and I was like, whoa, you know, wow. Um, what was one of the reasons for, you know, drinking wine? Well, if you go to Exodus 29, we'll start here. Okay, twenty nine forty. We'll do this real quick. I'll start in thirty eight. Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar two lambs of the first year, day by day continually. The one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the lamb thou shalt offer at even. And with the one lamb a tent dill of flour mingled with the fourth part of a hen of a hen of beaten oil, and the fourth part of a hen of wine for a drink offering. So it was a ceremonial thing, right? Yep. Amen. Absolutely. It was a ceremonial thing. Um, I don't condone the thing of, let me just go and say this right now. I don't condone the thing of just drinking habitually. That's a sin. That's what you call a wine bibber. If you're just drinking habitually all the time, you know, drinking every day, eh, yeah, you got some problems. What would be a reason for drinking wine in the Bible? Um, for ceremonial purposes, of course. It's not for an occasion of the flesh, okay? Um, God gave it to us for a blessing, and we're going to see that now here in a second. Um, but the next one, of course, it talks about drink offering. There's plenty of them, okay? Um, Deuteronomy 20, or Numbers 28, 7. We'll go there real quick. I mean, there's a lot more that I'm 
pointing out here, but these are just a, a few I picked out about the drink offering thing. There's a bunch in the Old Testament. Uh, 28 7 right here says, And the drink offering thereof shall be the fourth part of an hen for the one lamb, and the holy place shalt thou cause the strong wine to be poured unto the Lord for a drink offering. So again, that's an offering, it's a ceremonial thing. Again, um, All right, let's go to Deuteronomy 33. I'm going to try to get through this really quickly so I can maybe squeeze this in. I hope, hope my time doesn't run out, but I'm going to try to get this done. All right, we'll start in verse 27. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safely, safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon the land of corn and wine, and, the, and his heavens shall drop down dew. Hmm. How about that? Alright, Deuteronomy chapter 7. We'll go back a little bit. Talking about blessing Israel and stuff like that. It says, verse 12, Wherefore it shall come to pass, if ye hearken to these judgments, and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he sware unto the, to thy fathers. And he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee, and will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, thy corn and thy wine, and thine oil, the increase of thine kind, and the flocks of thy sheep, and the land which he sware unto thy fathers to give thee. So what was it? Thou shalt be blessed above all people. Verse 14, there you go. It'd be a blessing. Alright, I'm going to show you a verse to support this. If you go to Isaiah 65, um, verse 8, Thus saith the Lord God, or not, sorry about that, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. What's the blessing? The new wine. And people say, well, new wine found the cluster means it's not going to be alcoholic. Okay, just hold on. So I will do for my servant's sake and I'm, that I may not destroy them all. New wine found the cluster. I showed what it was. It was the grapes getting ready to be fermented. Okay. When the fermentation process starts in wine, okay, the cluster breaks open, the skin breaks open, the yeast breaks open the skin and release the blood, as you would say, the blood of the grape out. And you get that beautiful wine. And it starts fermenting. Yes. Alright. I'm going to show you something here. People say, well, new wine's not alcoholic. You know, they'll use that as an excuse. I'm going to show you this real quick. And um, I'm going to start at verse 12 here. And it says, They were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meanest this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. And it says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto him, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken, not, hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. So, is new wine alcoholic? Yes. It just means it just freshly come out of the cluster. See? That's what new wine is. You also have old wine, which is aged wine. You know, you let wine sit in barrels for a time, you know, for a long time to get that aging effect, you know. Some people like that aged taste. I mean, eh, not so much. I never really liked that aged taste. I like the newer. I like the newer stuff. But um, but yeah, new wine found in the cluster means it's not gone to the process yet, and you cannot get wine without the fermentation process. It doesn't work. They don't use the same grapes as grapes you use to make grape juice. It's not the same thing. Okay. Uh, like I said, there's over a thousand grapes, you know, wine grape species. So, let's keep going here. How about this one right here? You know, Psalm, we'll go to Psalm 104. Uh, verse 15. 
It says, And wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, and the cedars of Lebanon which he had planted. Yeah, and so on and so on. Basically what it's talking about when God is blessing a group of people, you know, um, then the wine is going to make your heart glad. There's also other mentions in the scriptures, what I'm going to talk about here in a minute, where God actually punished people through wine. We're going to get to that here in a minute. And let and turn them over to drunkenness and lasciviousness. We're going to talk about that too as we get keep going. But I'm going to show you verses that, you know, it says it's okay to drink wine. It's not a sin. Okay. All right, we'll go to Ecclesiastes 9.7, the next one. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepted thy works. Huh? Really? So is there, so God's okay with drinking wine? Yeah. Guess what? Jesus Christ drank wine. Yeah, he did. I'm going to show you that here in a little bit. Oh, Jesus is a sinner then. Get over yourself. I mean, really. You know, drinking alcohol is not a sin. Show me in Scripture where it says out drinking alcohol is a sin. Drinking wine is a sin. You won't find it. You're lying. All right. What's another reason? You know, for a merry heart and also what's another reason? Well, also for medical reasons. And we'll talk about this in a little bit further detail. Uh, for first Timothy five, 23, it says, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So wine is used, you know, it can actually get rid of like, you know, upset stomachs, you know, like you eat too much, you know, or something like that. And you get sick off of it and don't feel good. Wine can actually help you with that. You know, um, for many, many years, people have used alcohol um, to pour on open wounds, you know, like from gunshot wounds or snake bite wounds, and it kills the germs. That's why it burns, you know. Yes, it does. It's not a poison, like unlike uh, Chick Track says. You know, Chick Track says in their Charles Taniqui, uh I think it's the Alberto series, that alcohol is a poison. Uh, yeah, okay, you're bending the truth there. Uh, alcohol can become a poison if you overdo it. You know, you can overflow your liver, you know, and it just, it's not good, you know. You drink too much, get drunk, and then it becomes a poison, you see. Your body doesn't know what to do with all. That's why you get drunk, you see. Because your body doesn't know what to do with it. Drunkenness is a sin, okay. Drinking wine is not. That's a lie, okay. What about the commands not to drink? Okay, what about that, okay. We'll go to Leviticus chapter 10. Verse 9. All right. It says, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Um, why, did they, why didn't he just say, You're not allowed to drink strong drink or wine at all? Because it's not a sin. Okay? It's not a sin. You know, but he said, Don't drink it going into the tabernacle of the congregation. If Why would God contradict himself? You know, why would God say, oh, you know, it, why would he not tell him just not drink wine and liquor at all if it was a sin? See, why do you tell him not to drink it in the tabernacle of the congregation? See, you got a problem here. You got a big problem here. And you can see it's funny because he puts drink, wine, or nor strong drink because why? They're both alcoholic. They've both been fermented. If you research liquor... The process of liquor, like, you know, vodka and, you know, whiskey, it goes through pretty much a similar process that, you know, wine goes through, but it doesn't use grapes. It uses other ingredients, you know, but that's a whole other study. I'm not going to get into that, you know, just from, you know, if you've struggled with alcohol and stuff like that in your past, you've struggled with drinking, don't touch it, okay? Uh, be smart, you know, if you've never had a problem with alcohol and you want to do it, you know, you know, whatever... Um, for special occasions, that's fine. It's not a sin. Okay? It's not a sin. Okay. What's another reason? Okay, what about the vow of the Nazarite? No, Numbers chapter 6. And it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, 
speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite to separate themselves unto the Lord. All right, we're going to read down to verse 20 here, okay? It says, He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine, vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquors of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dry. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall no razor come upon his head, until the days be fulfilled, and in the which he separated himself unto the Lord, he shall be holy, and he shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. In all the days that he separated himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father, or for his mother, or for his brother, and for his sister, and when they die, because the consecration of God is upon his head. In all the days of his separation is, is he holy, he is holy unto the Lord. If any man die very suddenly by him, and he had defiled the head of his consecration, then he shall shave his head in the day of his clean cleansing, and on the seventh day shall he shave it. And on the eighth day he shall bring two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, to the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering, and the one other one for a burnt offering, and make an atonement for him, for that he is sinned by the dead. And he shall hollow his head that same day. He shall consecrate unto the Lord the days of his separation. He shall bring a lamb of the first year for a trespass offering, but the days that were before shall be lost because his separation was defiled. And this is the loss, this is the law of a Nazarite. And when the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He shall offer his burnt offering unto the Lord, one he, one he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, the one you lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering, and the one ram without blemish for peace offerings. And a basket of unleavened bread cakes and fine flour, mingled with oil and wafers, unleavened bread, anointed with oil, and their meat offerings and their drink offerings. And the priest shall bring them before the Lord, and shall offer his sin offering and his burnt offering. He shall offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, with the basket of unleavened bread. And the priest shall offer, offer all his, also his meat offering and his drink offering. And the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall take the hair of the head of his separation, and put it in the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offerings. And the priest shall take the sudden, the sodden shoulder of the ram, one unleavened cake out of the basket, one unleavened wafer, and shall put them upon the head, hands of the Nazarite, after the hair of his separation is shaven. And the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. This is holy for the priest, with the wave breast and heave shoulder, and after that, the Nazarite may drink wine. How about that? After the vow is over and the cleansing is done, he's able to drink wine again. Oh boy! Why didn't the Lord just say no wine, no drink, no 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 no? no, no. We're just gonna be you know we're just gonna be religious bigots you know and saying we can't have any of that stuff. Stop adding scripture, okay? Stop adding scripture. It really ticks me off when people do that. All right. Um. Here's a good one for you. Deuteronomy chapter 29. Now we saw the vow of the Nazarite. Okay. We're going to show you another one where God commanded them not to drink. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab, beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. And Moses called on called unto all of Israel and said unto them, Ye have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt unto the Pharaoh and unto all of his servants and unto all of his land. The great temptations which thine eyes have seen, the signs of those great miracles. Yet the Lord had not given you an heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear until this day. And I have led you forty years in the wilderness. Your clothes are not waxing old upon you, and thy shoe is not waxing old upon thy foot. Ye have not eaten bread, neither have you drunk wine or strong drink, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. So what's going on right here? It was fasting. See? Fasting. Yes, it was. All right. All right. What about what about some warnings in the Bible? What would be a good warning? Um, I'll give you the first good one. We'll go to Judges chapter thirteen. Um, there's another one in Exodus forty-four fifteen through twenty-one. It talks about not drinking wine in the tabernacle 
He goes back to Leviticus chapter 10. I'm not going to go there for time's sake, but you can read it. But, um, but Judges chapter 13. Um, it says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah, uh, the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee. So he said, Beware. Get that? I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, or eaten any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive, and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now, who is this boy here that they're talking about? Who's the son? Samson. And what was the reason for the Lord telling her not to drink strong drink or wine? Well, because she was pregnant. That's a common sense practice right there. You don't drink when you're pregnant. You know, if you're a pregnant lady, you know. <laughs> that's a pretty easy one, you know. Um... Okay, now we got, we go to the New Testament now, and Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop that must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine. Okay, bishop's not supposed to be given into wine. Nor striker, nor not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Uh, for if a man know not how to rule his house, own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, at least being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, at least he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Okay? What about deacons? It says, likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, nor given too much wine. You see that there? Much wine. So, a bishop is a lot, not allowed to have wine. Okay? And a deacon is. Hmm. wonder why that would be. Well, because, they, you know, I would believe that it's probably a good thing, you know, for a bishop, the leader of our congregation, to not be given into wine. Yeah, I would agree with that. Absolutely. Um, another verse for this is Titus chapter 1, verse 7. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self self-willed, not soon angry, nor given to wine, nor striker, nor given to filthy lucre, but lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word, as he had been taught, that he may be able to, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So again, a bishop is not to be given into wine. Not at all. Okay, what about women? Let me show you this one right here, real quick. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as become in holiness. Not false accusers, not given too much wine. Okay, not being a drunkard. In, in other words, you know, not in excess. We're going to see that later on. There's some scriptures to talk about in excess of wine. Um, teachers of good things that they may be able to teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Yeah. Okay. Now, what about the judgment of God? with wine okay this is a very interesting one okay this is one that was like whoa you know wow i didn't even realize this was even a thing you know until i started reading these passages you know about wine and stuff and i was like man you know because it's pretty incredible stuff um we'll start in um yeah we'll start in deuteronomy 32 Okay, we'll start in, um, 
Let's see here. Where are they going to start at? I don't even have a number written down for this. Wow, I'm brilliant. I don't know. Okay, we'll start in verse. <laughs> That's awesome when you just forget to. Okay, yeah, I'm in the right place. Yeah, I'm in the right chapter. I just don't remember. Okay, well, yeah, we'll just start in verse 9. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land in the waste howling wilderness. He led, led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. And as an eagle stareth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth out, spreadeth above her um, wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead them, and there was no strange God with him. He made him ride on the high places on the, of the earth that he might might eat the increase of the field he made him suck honey out of the rock and the oil out of the flinty rock butter of kine milk of sheep with fat lambs and rams of breed of bashan and goats with the fat of kidneys and wheat thou didst drink the pure blood of the grapes but jeshurun waxed fat and kicked thou art waxen fat and thou art grown thick thou art covered with fatness then he forsook God which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Uh, the blood of the grapes, of course, is wine, by the way, if you didn't know. Um, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, but the abominations provoked, them, provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them, because the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he, and he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation, for a fire kindleth in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountain. I will keep mischiefs upon them. Okay? Keep that in mind as we keep reading. I will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall burnt they shall be burnt with hunger, um devouring with burning heat. With bitter destruction, I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them, with the poison of serpents of the dust. The sword without, and terror within, shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, and the sucklings also with the man of gray hairs. I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries would behave themselves strangely, and lest they should say, Our hand is high, and the Lord had not done all this, for they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. At that, at that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. How should one chase a thousand, and, to, and two put ten thousand to flight, except a rock had sold them, and the Lord had shut them up? For the rock is not our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For, the, for their vine is the vine of Sodom, and the fields of, the, of Gomorrah, the grapes are grapes of gal, and the clusters are bitter. The wine is poison, is the poison of dragons, and the cruel venom of ass. Is, is not this laid up in store with me, and sealed up among my treasure? So again, what's, what's going on here? Well, God is, God has actually poisoned, you know, and made the vineyards bitter, you know, to wicked people. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to see that more along as we get, get, go over some more scriptures here. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things shall come upon them, them make haste. For the Lord shall judge his people, and repent himself for his servants. When he seeth that their power is gone, and there is none shut up or left, he shall say, Where are their gods? Their rock is whom they trusted, which did eat the fat, sacrifice it, and drink wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you, and be your protection. Yeah. So... You know, I see a lot of these Baptists will use that verse. See, you know, see, alcohol is, is, is the Satan's, you know, Satan's juice or whatever, devil's juice or whatever. 
Get out of here. You know what I'm talking about. Why don't you read the context of the scripture and see what's going on here? Please. Devil's juice. Give me a break. All right. Moving on. I mean, there's so many I could use on this, you know, but I'm just going to cover. I'm probably just going to cover a few of these. We've got Hosea chapter 4, Hosea 7, and Hosea chapter 9. Um. Let me show you this real quick. Where is Hosea? Okay, there it is. All right. I'm going to start in verse 6. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no pre priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children, as they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore, I will change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people. They they set their hearts on their iniquity. Well, first of all, who's my people here? It's Israel. Okay. Hear the word, you know, verse one. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. This is not talking about Christians, by the way. These work salvationist type, these holiness idiots. We'll try to use this to say this is Christians. Uh, nothing can be further from the truth. And there shall be like people like priests and I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their doings for they shall eat and, and not have enough they shall commit whoredom and shall not increase because they have left off to take heed to the Lord whoredom and wine the new wine take away the heart yeah my people ask counsels at their stocks and their staff to clear it unto them and the spirit of whoredom had caused them to err and they have gone a whoring from under their God so what's the so what's the point here okay the new wine and the wine take away the heart. Well, when you start forsaking the Lord, you know, what does God do to you? You know, uh, Romans chapter 1. Yeah. Uh, God starts giving you what you want. You know, we're going to see that as we keep going here. Hosea chapter 7. It says, When I have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered, and the wickedness of Samaria, for they commit falsehood, and the thief cometh in, and the troop of robbers spoileth without, and they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. They make the king glad with their wickedness, and the princes with their lies. They are all adulterers, and as an oven heated by the baker, who ceaseth from raising after he had kneaded the dough until it be leavened. In the day of our king, the princes have made him sick with bottles of wine. He stretched out his hand with scorners. Hmm. Made him sick? How? How can you get sick from wine? Drinking too much. Yeah. You know, um, it can poison you if you drink too much because your body does not know what to do with it. Your body can't process it if you over drink. You know. Uh, let's see here. Let's go on to the next one. Hosea chapter 9. It says, Rejoice not, O Israel, for joy as other people. For thou hast gone a whoring from thy God. Thou hast loved a reward upon every cornflower. The floor and the winepress shall not feed them. And the new wine shall fail in her. You mean God actually will cause the vineyards to fail? Yeah. Guess what? Because God has the ingredients in the air to make the wine. We read earlier that it's a magical phenomenon. Okay. It's a natural process that happens. So God can actually cause that to fail. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. So again, what's going on? This is talking about Israel's rebellion to the Lord. You know, so God punishes them and doesn't give them things that, you know, he calls a blessing. You know, like in Isaiah 65. Yes, he does. All right, so we'll go to Isaiah chapter 5. A lot of scripture to go through here, guys. Just bear with me. It says in verse 5, And now go to, and I will tell you what I will do with, to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned, nor digged, and there shall come upon briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that rain, that the rain, no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah is pleasant plant. He looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. 
Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ear saith the Lord of hosts, Of a truth many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitants. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of an horner shall yield an ephah. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that they continue until night, till wine aflame them. You see this right here, that they that continue until night. What does that mean? They're drunkards. Okay? And the harp, and the vial, and the tabret, and the pipe, and wine are in their feast, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore hell had enlarged herself, and opened her without open her mouth without measure, and the glory and their multitude and their pomp, he that rejoices shall descend into it, and that mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty men shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. With the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. So again, you see it there. You know, God's given them over their, to their vile affections, you see. Um, when you start drinking, when you start drinking wine, you know, and you start drinking in excess, God will judge you. Absolutely. Um, you know, and let me, let me say this too, you know, why don't you start blaming the wicked sinner that's drinking the wine and getting drunk? Okay. If they're drinking any kind of alcoholic beverage and they're getting drunk off of it, uh, that's their depravity. Stop sitting there saying that, that, you know, the alcohol or whatever is devil's juice. How about the sinner drinking it? Hmm. You know, how about that? Who's to blame here? Is it man to blame or is the alcohol to blame? Is the alcohol get you drunk or is man so depraved that they got to have a pleasure? What's the difference here? See? You know, I see this all the time. It's, you know, alcohol is devil's juice. Oh, how about the people actually drinking it? You know? You let yourself go so far to get drunk. You deserve judgment. You know? You deserve something, you know, something happened to you. It's very stupid. You know, that's why we're told to drink responsibly. That's why a lot of these, you know, ads and stuff like that, they say drink responsibly. Yeah, we're going to read here in a minute about, you know, destroying, you know, a house and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Isaiah 28. These are some of the dangers, you know, of alcohol and the warnings, the curses. Oh God, the judgment, I guess you could say. Woe to the crown of pride. Get a hold of that. For to the drunkards of Ephraim. Drunkards. You get that, right? Drunkards. Drunkard, drunkardness is a sin. Not drinking wine. Drunkards. His glorious beauty is fading flower, which are on the head of the valleys that of them that are overcome with wine. Overcome with wine. All right. Behold, the Lord had mighty and strong one, which as tempests have hail and destroying a storm, and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trotted down underfoot. The drunkards. Again, who's to blame here? You know, it's like people that try to blame Satan for everything. You know, they try to blame the devils. Uh, no, Satan didn't make you do it. Your own depravity made you do it. You need to repent and take heed to the word. You know, stop putting blame. You know, if you're one of these people out there that just want to blame alcohol, why don't you blame the sinners? You know, why don't you blame wicked men? You know. Alright, how about this one? Habakkuk chapter 2. Verse 4 and 5. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. You get that? A man that's not upright. But the just shall live by his faith. Yea, also, because he transgressed by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlarges his desire as hell, and his and as death cannot be satisfied, but gathered unto him all nations and heaped to him all people. Um, you understand what you understand that a lot of people that are you know these bar hoppers and stuff like that, these people that are you know they don't keep at home, you know taking care of their family like they're supposed to, they're out busy drinking and stuff. They're not upright in the heart. You know, they're not upright with God. They're not, they're not an upright man. Not at all. You're out doing that kind of thing right there. You're not being a keeper at home, you know, with your family. 
his desire as hell. He enlarged his desire as hell. Yeah, that's what God thinks of you. You know, you bar hoppers out there. That's what God thinks of you. You know, won't you be at home with your family? What are you doing running around at midnight drinking in public places when you, places you have no reason, no places to be? You call yourself a Christian. You know, if you call yourself a Christian and you're bar hopping, I question your salvation. Absolutely. See, right here. His soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Yea, also because he transgressed by wine. Well, how is he transgressed by wine? Drunkenness. That's how. He is proud man, neither keep it at home, and large his desire as hell is as death, and cannot be satisfied. You know, he's not going to be satisfied with one woman. More than likely, he's probably going to be fornicating as well. You know, but gather unto him all nations, and heap it him all people. So yeah, there you go. You know, you know, Timothy also talks about, you know, if any provide not for their own, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Yeah. Okay, check this out. Talking about what we're just talking about here. Uh, Proverbs chapter 20. Verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. What does it mean by that? Does it mean you can't have it? No. I mean, we read in other places earlier that it says it's okay, right? Yeah. So what's going on here? If you're a wine bibber, you know, somebody that drinks perpetually all the time, whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Yeah. Um, we'll go to Proverbs chapter 23. Uh, verse 20. It says right here, Be not among wine bibbers, among rightous ears of flesh. Okay. Um, I've always believed that among rightous ears of flesh is people that indulge in the flesh. You know, are drunkards, pretty much. You know, I don't believe it means actually eating meat. Um... It says, For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe the man with rags. So again, you know, uh, wine bibbers are drunkards. A wine bibber is somebody habitually, if you look up the term wine bibber in the 1828 dictionary, it's somebody that perpetually, habitually drinks wine all the time. And just all, can't ever get their fill. That's a wine bibber. Alright, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Now we're going to get the New Testament. There's not really a lot of verses in the New Testament that talk about it, but here's one. Ephesians 5.18 it says, it says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. You get that. Excess. But be filled with the Spirit. Okay? So if you're drunk with wine, you're, that's excess. Yeah. So is having a glass of wine okay? Yeah. Absolutely. On occasion, I would say this. Don't be a habitual. Don't be a wine bibber. Okay? There's a dividing line. So what would be a good time to have a glass of wine? Well, I said earlier, I would say for um, special occasions, you know, the Israelites did at the Passover. They did all, they did for drink offerings, you know, and of course at a marriage that we're going to talk about here in a minute where Jesus turned water into wine, you know. Um, let me show you this one right here. Okay, verse 18, it says, For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God, all things that indeed are pure, but is evil for that man who eateth with offense. Okay? It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine or anything thereby thy, whereby thy brother stumbleth. Okay? Or is offended or is made weak. What's it talking about here? Um, if you have a weak brother, you know, and you're drinking wine or something like that, and you're drinking or you're having a, some flesh or whatever, some meat, it may cause the brother to stumble into gluttony, you know, got to be careful of, uh, weak Christians, you know, um, you know, whereby thy brother stumbleth is offended or is made weak, you know, um, 
like in First Corinthians chapter, let me show this real quick, verse 11. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. They're weak in the faith, you know? Yeah, that's what it's talking about. You know, you got to be careful. Um, you know, I wouldn't be drinking around a weak brother, or anything, like having a glass of wine around a weak brother, or eating something that can cause them that they're struggling with gluttony or something like that. And, you know, if you're a vegan out there, that's not justifying veganism. Veganism is a doctrine of devils, okay? They'll come over here and say we should be stop eating meat altogether. You're a liar. Don't even try, don't even try that. But, um, but basically, you know, you got a brother that struggles with gluttony or struggles with, uh, you know, drinking. You gotta be careful with that. You know, absolutely. And that's why I made a strong warning. If you've had a problem with alcohol in the past, you do well to stay away from it altogether. Okay. Um, all right, we'll go to. First Peter four three, it says, "For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, and when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine." You get that again? Excess it doesn't say no wine or wine at all. It just says excess of wine. There's a big difference: revelings, banqueting, and abominable idolatries. Excess of wine. Okay. And of course, drunkenness is in Galatians five nineteen through twenty one. I'll show you this real quick. Um, almost done here, but um, now the works of the flesh are manifest. Now get this: works of the flesh. Okay, is it the alcohol's fault that you got drunk? Uh uh-uh, uh, it's your flesh. Which are these: adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders drunkenness, revelings, and such like, and that which I tell you before, and as I have also told you in time past, they that which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is spiritual fellowship there, like in Romans fourteen seventeen talks about. Okay? Um, but again, should you... Uh, so, I mean, how should I say this? Um, it's drunkenness. Okay? Should you just blame the alcohol? It's the alcohol's fault. It's devil's use. Marr. You know, just have this chip on your shoulder, you know. No. And you say, well, the alcohol's destroyed so many lives. Okay, how about the wicked person that picked it up and decided to get drunk one day? You know? No. They don't have any accountability. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's like saying guns are evil and wicked, you know. They kill people. Uh, who shoots guns? Man? Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, you know, I'm not going to cover really the uh, verses uh, about the Passover or anything like that. I mean, those are pretty self-explanatory. But um, but yeah, I will talk about John chapter two. You know, being a special occasion, and it says the third day was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage and when they wanted wine the mother of Jesus said unto him they have no wine and Jesus said unto her woman what what have I to do with thee from mine hour is not yet come his mother saith unto the servants whatsoever he saith unto you do it and there were and there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews contained two uh, or three firkins apiece and Jesus saith unto them filled the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and said unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. The beginning of, beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested both forth, manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. Okay, do you understand here? Right here. Jesus turned water into actual wine, not grape juice. First of all, grape juice wasn't even invented until the 1800s. So how do you reconcile that? Okay. 
It was unfermented. There's no such thing as unfermented wine. Get that through your thick skull. If you're out there still holding to this tradition, this tradition of man, there's no such thing as unfermented wine. You can't have it. It doesn't work. Okay? I've been, I've worked in the vineyard. I've worked in the winery. I know. You can't have unfermented wine. It doesn't work. Okay? You know, don't be stubborn and try to say that alcohol is a sin. There's no scripture to support that. What's a sin in the Bible? Drunkenness. Okay? I made it clear as day. I don't know how much more clear it can be. And you're just like, you're just going to be narrow-minded and bigoted about it. Well, I can't help you. You know, don't be condemning others that alcohol is a sin. You're going to give an account to God one day for that. Okay? Well, Jesus, Jesus didn't drink wine. He didn't right here. You know, I'm going to show you something where he did. Let me show you this. People say Jesus never drank wine. Oh, yes, he did too. Okay, John, Luke chapter 7. Verse 33. All right, it says, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and he say he had a devil. The Son of Man come, the Son of Man is come eating and drinking. And ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners. Yeah, he was drinking wine. Absolutely. Okay. Now let's go, let's go to the, uh, let's go to the supper. Luke 22. It says, and they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour has come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks. Take this and divide it among yourselves. And I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. What is the fruit of the vine? The grapes, you know, wine grapes. <coughs> Until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it. And he gave unto them and saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. <coughs> <coughs> and likewise also the cup after supper saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Okay. Now again, he says right here, I will not drink of the vine until the kingdom of God is fulfilled. Right? Yeah. After after he got done with the Passover and he was getting ready to suffer, he will not drink until the kingdom of God is fulfilled. Which in this passage here is talking about the kingdom of heaven. Okay? So, I want to make that very clear. You know. Um, and let me say this in closing. Um, it's not a sin to drink wine. Uh, I would say, you know, for special occasions, fine. No problem. Um, and I would say for communion, I would say drink wine if you're of age. Absolutely. Um, don't be drinking grape juice. That was a, that was a tradition, tradition introduced by the Methodists and the Methodists are very wicked. Uh, I've done a lot of research into the Methodists. A lot of these guys are work salvationists. They don't even believe in the atonement of Christ, for goodness sake. You know, you want to follow a tradition after the Methodists, they're going to hell and they're going to burn forever, you know, because they don't want to. Be a, they don't want to drink, drink alcohol. They want to be prudish, you know. Yeah, that's what it's all about, you know. Self righteousness. That's what the whole thing's about, you know. But um, um, so they invented Welch's grape juice. I proved it. It came from the Methodists. Methodists is a very weak, a very wicked group. Um. So they don't even, like I said, they don't even believe in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They don't even believe that can save them. They believe they have to work their way to heaven. Um, I've done a lot, like I said, I've done a lot of study into it. But um, the thing is, is that um, if you're of a, of age, have a little sip. You know, you know, if you're want to want to perform communion, sure, fine, a little sip. You know, you don't have to have like a big glass, you know, big gigantic glass, whatever. And, and just a warning to you, if you have struggles with your flesh. I'm going to advise you to stay away from it altogether, okay? I don't want you to come to me and tell me, I, I, you tell me it's okay to drink wine. No, I didn't. I'm making a warning now. If you have struggles with your flesh, you know, stay away from it, okay? Wine is a mocker, and if you let it control you, it will mock you, okay? That's my warning. But to say that wine itself is a sin, that any, any kind of alcohol is a sin, 
Uh, you're stretching the truth, okay? You're not being honest. There's no scripture to support that. Um, and let me say this too. You need to be careful about drinking beer. Okay, I would stay away from any of that stuff. A lot of the beer is, you know, like from Anheuser-Busch and all that stuff. That, a lot of that stuff's synthetic. You know, they put a lot of fake crap in it. You know, stay away from it. Okay? Stay away from that kind of stuff, you know. I'd stay away from strong drink. That's just what I would do. I wouldn't touch it. A glass of wine for special occasions, fine. Um, that's, that's the limitation. You stop with one glass and be done. Don't go any further. Okay? Um, so... With that being said, uh, this was a very tough study, and I really debated on whether I was going to bring it out or not. And uh, you know, and uh, you know, just be careful about adding to God's word. Okay, I know a lot of people did out of ignorance and think that alcohol is a sin. Like I said, there's no scripture to support that. Um, again, I proved this over and over and over again. So I think that's going to be it. Uh, thank you for watching.